Hey, this is Brent Jensen. You're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. And we are on episode number four in a special six-part series brought to you by Steam Whistle. And we are at the Steam Whistle Roundhouse in Toronto City, downtown. Fantastic place. I have a friend of the show returning for, I think it's like your 24th time on the show, and her guitarist, <laughs> Jeff Brown. It is Susie Corey. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> nice to have you back. How are you? Thank you. I am so excited to be here. I'm really great. It's been a little while. We were saying it's great to be live, right? And doing this in person. You know, Steam Whistle's fantastic. This is the first time since March that I've actually done live episodes and had live bodies in front of me, you know, instead of, you know, doing it over the phone. So it's fantastic. Yeah, live bodies are a good thing. Live bodies are good. <laughs> bodies. Better than dead bodies. <laughs> what kind of podcast do you listen to? But yeah, this is really cool. You know, I had said that I'd been to the Steam Whistle in passing, kind of on a work-related thing. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time I got to hang out here for a bit. And I know we're going to be doing some uh, stuff after. Some uh, (laughs) drinking stuff after. Some (laughs) tasting. Which we're all looking forward to. If you behave yourself, we are. Well, I was saying maybe I should have done the tasting before the uh, podcast interview. No. It might have been a lot more fun. It would have been a different You would have gotten some information you might not be getting now. Oh, really? (laughs) Hmm. Are you talking about the listeners or me? Whoever's out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a lot of stuff to catch up on. You're going to play. Jeff Brown is here. Yeah. Which is great. So you guys are going to play a tune. Um, tell me about Love Revolution. The single or the whole festival? The whole idea, <laughs> the whole idea of Love Revolution. So it's really weird because, you know, I came up with the idea last year and um, I wrote the song and recorded it in July of 2019. And I kind of held on to the song because I felt the change coming and that's what the song talks about. It's a very kind of retro 60s hippie feel mm-hmm. to it. And to me, it was because I saw something coming in 2020. And not because I knew anything about what was actually going to happen this year, but because I felt something about the year 2020. I'm all about numbers and things like that. That something huge was coming and it's a positive thing. It's a really great thing in where humanity is going and where things are going. And so I left it and then things started to happen in March of this year. And then by the summer, I'm just like, okay, I think it's time that I release this song. I think this is the time for it. People need something that's uplifting and talks about love and let's spread the love. And, you know, because for the past few months, we'd been like being told to be separate and keep our distance from people. And in some ways it was hard because not having that human touch, we know Mm -hmm. like hugging and kissing and, you know, just being um, very human. It's very difficult when we're being told not to do that. We understand because of the circumstances, everything that's happening, we've kind of had to be more cautious. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to bring something back into the world that could possibly, you know, just let people know that we still need to love each other. And so I put out the song and instead of doing the normal thing where you would, you know, put out a song and go and tour, which obviously not a lot of people are able to do right now, or making a music video to support the single, I thought rather than take the money and do a music video, why don't I do something that has more significance and shows people what is Love Revolution about and show them And so I've always said how I'm such a hippie and I love Woodstock and wish I had been there. Well, I want to create my own kind of little Woodstock. And so I'd read about drive-in festivals and it automatically, you know, it was just a concept at that time when I first read about it Mm -hmm. and I jumped right on it. I'm like, you know what? Drive-in festival, let's do it. And even when I first mentioned it to people, they would be like, oh yeah, there's a drive-in here. There's drive-ins around Ontario. And I said, no, you know, I don't want it at a drive-in. I don't want concrete. I want grass. I want a field. I want people sitting out in nature and have the whole vibe of what love is about. And, you know, that day to this day, it was one of the most incredible days. Jeff was there too. He played with four different artists. Oh, <laughs> or <wow>. five. <laughs> And, you know, he knows there was just so much love around. It Mm. was unbelievable between the artists, us, the musicians, the people who came to watch saying, we're so thankful for this, you know, and it filled my heart like nothing I've ever done in my life. So moving forward, I was like, this showed me what you need to look at doing. You know, if you're going to be a musical artist, do something of value that doesn't just necessarily have to be about yourself do it for the greater good and for a lot of people and the happiness multiplies and the success multiplies you know it's it's incredible 
You are so industrious. <laughs> uh, honestly, like you're like so just you're so big. It's great. I, I think that's fantastic that you did that. Thank it's you. um, you know, people kind of do their own little thing often, right? And they yeah. get by. But you're one of those people who gets out there and says, "I want to bring everybody together. I want to do something on a bigger scale." And I think that's fantastic that you did that. Well, you know, again, we had talked about this earlier, as we always do before a podcast. You mm. know, we have conversations on the side, and I mentioned that. To me, the idea of people seeing things as competition, you know, whether it's for awards and things like that, where or numbers and streaming and all this, it takes the focus off of what's really important mm -hmm. is that let's work together because together we can build something massive. During the Love Revolution Festival, I made a conscious effort. I know a lot of musicians. I know a lot of artists, and I'm not trying to be cocky about it. It's just I've been, you know, I'm always out there. Got really lucky sometimes. One person introduced me to another. So I know a lot of people in the industry, well-known people. Mm -hmm. But I went, that's not the people I want on this. I want it to be the independent artists who are doing things on their own and show, look what we can make happen because we stick together and we made this happen. You know, and we found a way to put on a big festival when some other majors couldn't do it. That's so, fantastic right there. Yeah. You know, we were talking about this before we started rolling. Steam Whistle is about that indie ethos and have supported indie, you know, going way back. They used to hold weekly. Yeah. Like it, but that's, <laughs> what, that, that's what Steam Whistle is about. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here. We, I talked about that in the previous episode. But I love that because those people see them. They can be so talented and you see something in them. You want to do everything you can to kind of shine a light on them and make them, you know, make people more aware. Right. And it wasn't about me being some big promoter or being someone who's already up there in the music industry shining a light on them. It was trying to show everybody, look what we can do, because mm -hmm. I'm one of you too, right? I'm yeah. still up and coming and working my way through the industry. But that doesn't mean that we can't get something like a festival off the ground and make it successful. And it was, you know, people came out, they all wanted to see us. They were so happy that we put it on. And I think it showed everyone what we are truly capable of. And, you know, again, not having to be at any level in the music industry to realize that you can make something like that happen. Mm -hmm. So it's all mind over matter, right? <laughs> you are a force, Susie Corey. Now that's great. So when's the next one now? Um, well, you know, I kind of leave it to the universe in some ways. I do put it out there what I want. And I have a vision that I'd like to do it in Australia. Mm. And, you know, I put it out there and kind of went, okay, I, I really don't have connections in Australia. But I was thinking it makes sense because it's a huge country fan base there. Absolutely. Like they love their country. And the other thing is, they're going on summer, <laughs> so yeah. it would make sense because it's the only place, not the only place in the world, but one of the few places where you could do it at this time in January, February. That's right. Yeah, so it would give me time to plan something else. You know, again, just the way my life works is I put it out there and then something comes along and it goes, here, this person can help you. So I ended up doing this radio interview two days ago. Mm. Little did I know, you know, we end up talking about, the, he had heard about the Love Revolution Festival, wanted to interview me about that and the whole thing. Um, and after the radio interview, him and I got talking some more and he said to me, well, where are you thinking of doing it next? I go, well, oddly enough, where you are in Australia, <laughs> but it never even occurred to me to ask him, you know, or say anything. And he went, well, I know a lot of people. I can put you in touch with some, there, there you, you go. go. There you go. <laughs> I go, let's make this happen. Why not? Wow. So. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you. I was saying to Jeff earlier, it's like watching a movie. You, you kind of, you know, <laughs> watching you do what you're doing. It's just I've known you for a couple of years now. It's like, okay, 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 okay. So very interesting. Well, I think it's great because it shows people like how to, you know, a lot of the people that I know, because mm -hmm. they know me, I'm a regular person. I'm nothing, you know. But that's what's cool about it. Right. But that's what you want to put in people that you can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, all you have to do is envision it yeah. and you can make it happen. Don't stand in your own way. That's all. Anthony Robbins has nothing on you, Susie Corey. <laughs> all right. Listen, so you've got a list of songs here. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that all of the songs from your list are from the 70s, except there's one from 1980. Right. But uh, I wanted to ask you why that was. There's a reason for that. Oddly enough, no. But I think, you know, I was thinking about this this morning because you mentioned it and I went, 
That's really weird because um, earlier this morning I was looking through them. I told you I was kind of looking at the background of some of the songs because I wanted to sound really smart on your podcast <laughs> and um, <laughs> have some background information. Because sometimes, you know, you like songs and you right. just like them at face value. It's yes. not for any, I haven't gone in depth into the lyrics or it makes me feel something, makes my skin vibrate, right? <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to know a little bit more about the stories behind them. So I went in and did that. And I noticed that, yeah, like you're saying, they're all from the 70s yeah. and I realized when I was in LA um, in August and September I was recording two more new songs and one of them is a really feel-good song the other one is called 1975 ah. and it's all about the vibes of 1975 and kind of like southern rock and you know just feeling good and I, I love what the 70s are about mm -hmm. as much as I'm a hippie but 70s I mean are just something else musically oh I totally agree I've said so, that a million times between, say, 75 and 82, you know, the rock that was produced during that period is just unparalleled for me. Right. And I just don't think anything, you know, without putting people down currently, nothing really compares to that. No. I can't see anything that's happening now that comes even close to mm -hmm. what happened back then. We all go through stages sometimes where you're listening to certain genres of music or certain eras of music. And I've been just the past two months really engulfed in listening to all these 70s bands mm -hmm. and 70s sounds and i'm finding that's really where i feel at home yeah i yeah even though i grew up in the 80s and you know a lot of pop uh, and i was there with all the superstars you know michael jackson madonna cindy lopper and all of that but the thing that really touches me is more 70s mm -hmm. and southern rock music but also like one of the artists joan baez you know i'm really into that as well well, let's kick it off. So Joan Baez is first on your list with Diamonds and Rust. Yeah, I mean, to me, that is one of the most beautiful songs, vocally, lyrically, just everything about it, the sound of it, the production, it has this eeriness to it. Mm -hmm. But I think we can all relate to that. Of course, I found out not this morning, but <laughs> a long time ago when I started to love this song, I looked into it and kind of understood that she'd written it about Bob Dylan, yes. even though she didn't tell him that. She told him it was about her husband. Oh, really? And he was like, but that doesn't make sense, you know, because the, the lyrics don't make sense with what she's telling him. But later on, she did admit in interviews that it is about Bob Dylan. Isn't there a, there's a lyric in there about Washington Square, right? Yes. So wouldn't he know? I know. And he called her and it says, you called me from Washington Square and he's yeah. telling her the lyrics to one of his songs. And right. So, yeah. It's like pretty yeah. <laughs> detailed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I guess it was a blurry time. Uh, have you heard, Judas Priest actually does a, a cover of this. Have you heard that? I found out that out this morning. Yeah, yeah, and did <laughs> very Wikipedia. well. Yeah, and she was apparently very impressed. Oh, I didn't is that know, right? Yeah, but I, I haven't heard the version of it. Oh, that's good. I always believe that if you're going to cover a song, whether it's live or recording it, you need to make it your own. But I do study other vocalists, and for example, with her, it's listening to how she does that vibrato and so controlled on every oh, single know. end of the sentence, you know, every phrase that Isn't she that does. The best? And Emmy Lou Harris does that too, I yes. noticed. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's an interesting way of singing. Oh, it's one of my favorite things about singing. I was talking to uh, Sandra Boza about this, To Sir With Love. Just that very even vibrato is just so compelling, you know? Right. I love it. Love it. Uh, next, you have Bellamy Brothers, Let Your Love Flow, 1976. You know, I remember that song from probably my childhood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here I am dating myself. But it's so funny. It's one of those songs, like one of the other ones on the list as well, which I'll tell you after. I came across it again recently, mm -hmm. and I went, oh, my God, I remember that song. I, I love that song, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it brings back memories of stuff. But more than ever, the fact that it came up recently, I came across it. You know, when you listen to Spotify and it puts you totally. songs that you possibly like, mm -hmm. and they picked that song, I was like, wow, <laughs> yes, I do love this song. Um, but it is so much my vibe because the whole thing with the love revolution. Yes. And I remember thinking I should have had one song where all the artists come up and sing it together. Uh. And at the first love revolution, I got everybody to come up and sing love revolution, the song. Oh, and I realized, wow, really? no, I should have just chosen a universal song that is not my own song, but just, you know, a universal song. I thought about Imagine from John Lennon. And then when I heard this, I went, that's the song that, that we should have cool. done. Yeah, Let Your Love Flow, you know? And I love it because it's not a love song. I'm, you know, I, it's not like I'm anti-love, but for me, it's loving people and loving yourself and a general love that's more important than anything because 
when it's not focused on one person, again, like anything else, it just expands and it's so much bigger and mm -hmm. makes the universe better. <laughs> You know, where it's a love between a man and a woman, that's just like, you know, very packaged. <laughs> but when it's a love, you are love, you know, you're just full of love. You can do so much you're, and you can give a, so much to you're, people. You're a perennial hippie. <laughs> you truly are. People probably think I smoke stuff. And the thing is, I don't, you know, <laughs> but I sound like I do. Oh, yeah, this is the love. We need to love each other. That's why I'm having a hard time right now with this whole COVID thing, because I'm just like, I got to hug people. If you need me to wear a mask, I'll wear a mask, but I need to hug you, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, Little River Band, Cool Change is next. Yeah, so, and again, another song I heard, you know, a few weeks ago on a playlist, because I told you I was kind of pulling up the 70s stuff, and that's another one. I remember that from when I was younger. It's funny because I read this morning about the story behind it. First of all, I didn't realize they were an Australian band. Mm. I thought it was an American band because it kind of has that yacht rock feel to it. It, it totally does. Yeah, totally. So it was surprising to find that out. But the other thing was that it was written about, he was having a hard time with his guitarist in the band and it was kind of like his call for help <laughs> and wanting freedom. And Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I think it's difficult sometimes being part of an entity. I always do wonder what that's like. I mean, with myself, it's hired musicians and no disrespect, I love these guys and Jeff knows that. We're, you know, we're like family. Yeah. But I think when you're a band and you're writing together and there's a lot of different forces working together creatively, mm -hmm. as opposed to where I just say, here's my songs, can you learn them? And then we just try and gel on stage and make sure that we're vibing. Yes. But it's different when creatively you've got to work with people and, you know, band is family and you'll have people who disagree Oh, yeah. And then trying to keep that going and keeping it in a healthy way. So, Well, especially with all those factors that impact, you know, outside influences, fame, wealth. I empathize with those guys. It's not, and you, you, you've heard, I mean, myriad stories from bands saying, yeah, we were all brothers when we started Van Halen. Let's split everything four ways. We yeah. love each other. We're not, you know, and people tried to say, don't do that. No, 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 we're going to do that. And look at, the, you look at what happened to those poor guys. <laughs> you know, David Lee Roth went that way. Eddie Van went, went. It was just, it was, a, it's a disaster. Yeah. yeah. Well, like you said, I think, you know, the more people get involved, because even in a solo career, I personally, I'm quite happy doing stuff on my own, not because I, I love people, but I think in the management of an artist, especially early on, when mm -hmm. you're still figuring things out for yourself. I mean, you know, I started off doing rock and then realized on my own that maybe that's not really where I need to be going. And I, organically turned to country and I went mm -hmm. okay country rock that's working for me you know and that's what I feel yeah so had I had people come in earlier on and try and manage that or manage me or it becomes challenging so being a solo artist that's one of the things I pride myself on is that I can make my decisions and figure out who I am truly right so that when you try and build a career out of that you can do this for years and be happy with what you're doing because you know it's true to who you are absolutely and it's not someone else you know so imagine bands when they have all these people coming in and then you know even like one of my favorite bands Guns and Roses mm. they ended up having each person had their own manager it's like <laughs> how do you do that so this person would say talk to your manager talks to my manager well, why don't you just talk to each other? Because exactly. you've been doing that initially, you That's know? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's Silly. just craziness. Yeah. Um, you have some explaining to do for your next pick. Sure. Leonard Skinner, <laughs> Freebird. I love them. I mean, I, lo I love their sound. There's something about, I mean, the whole song is incredible, but the solo, and I think <laughs> Jeff, my guitarist, can attest to that. It's crazy. I yeah. just, I get all... <laughs> You know, when I hear it, I listen to it when I'm walking. Usually I, I walk every day and I'll put it on. It starts off so slow and, you know, and the words and everything about it, just the song, because it's the typical song for a musician and that kind of lifestyle, which is very difficult on a lot of people because you're going to miss out on things. But someone who loves music and loves that life, you can't go any other way, mm. you know, but it means having to sacrifice a lot of things. And so I get that whole thing. I feel in so many ways I'm a free bird and, you know, I've, I've never been happier right now because my kids are older. I'm able to kind of do what I have to do and not worry about those things. Yeah. And it's been the most beautiful thing in my life. And that's when you can creatively create stuff. You're not, you don't have a lot of restrictions and you can, you know, just, I'm able, as you know, to fly off, go here or there, yeah. or whatever. I don't think twice about something once it comes into my head. 
I get moving on it. So that's why, you know, the song, I resonate with it personally, not because I'm on their level by any means, but the whole story of it. You know, mm -hmm. I think being a creative person, being an artist, having freedom, whether it's physical freedom to move everywhere or just having the time to figure out things for yourself. Yeah. You've got to create that space for yourself. And any person who's going to be with someone like that needs to understand that and make sure that that's happening so oh, that they can sure. have a, some kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But back to the solo. <laughs> <laughs> What about That's the crazy live. I heard it was going to like 14 minutes, the song. Oh, they, yeah. Jamming. Yeah. It, and it, it just unreal. goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. And I don't know if you know, but the uh, keyboard also player was their roadie. And he'd written this part with that song. Mm. And then they found out that he'd done this. And then they got him, they hired him on as the keyboard player. No way. I, yeah. didn't, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. I can't even think of his name. Oh, God. Um, Bill. I can't think right now. Come mm. on, Jeff, help me out. <laughs> Leonard Skinner. <laughs> All right, your last pick is Woman by John Lennon. You know, it's funny. I, I'm a huge fan of John Lennon. Mm. Like I just, I love him. I know he wasn't perfect by any means. You got to understand that people do have, do, you know, they're human at mm -hmm. the end of the day. But it's just, uh, there's something about him and his creative side that, sorry, I resonate with a lot. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love his solo stuff more mm -hmm. so I'll probably get insulted for this um, more so than the Beatles. You know, I think the Beatles are great, but I really love his solo work as much as I know there was a lot of tension with people between the fans and Yoko Ono, mm. but I think she shined a light on him also and was a big part of that. Like I watched, there was um, uh, on Netflix, a documentary yeah. It's called above us only sky. I think I haven't seen it can't remember but yeah you have to watch it it's him recording the album oh and the double fantasy i believe so okay. yeah so she's there along with him and or maybe it wasn't the album no it was um when they recorded imagine she actually wrote the words the lyrics to imagine and he did not acknowledge that on the um you know what do you call it like the writing credit yeah on really? the writing credits she was never credited but he did admit to it afterwards and it's like yeah Really? And you see it in there where she's sitting in the studio and she's writing out the lyrics and coming up with lyrics for Imagine. And that's one of my favorite songs ever. And I didn't even realize that until I watched this documentary. I didn't know that either. Because I am somebody who pulls up, you know, who writing credits. I like to know who the writers are yeah, on sure. songs. So, hmm. yeah. Kudos to Yoko Ono. Yeah. You're going to get some rocks <laughs> thrown at you for that. All right. So that is the end of your list. Now you're going to play a song of your own, I believe. Sure. Um, what are you usually do? I do the slow one, but we're going to do a fast one first. Outlaw. I wanted to write a song that was a little bit more rock mm. song. So obviously it doesn't sound so rock here with just an acoustic guitar. But I was writing with um, my producer, who's also my co-writer. And we were, you know, I want to said, I want to talk about a story about a woman who's just working her way up through, whether it's the music industry or any industry, and just doing things her own way. Mm. Guess who I was talking about? <laughs> But, you know, it was kind of to inspire women to say, just trust your instinct and go with that, you know, because I know that that's what I do. And mm. so that's why, you know, but if a man wants to use the song and help inspire him, which is oddly enough, some bikers I found out were listening to this while they're writing. I'm like, that's crazy. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. They're like, oh, it pumps us up. I'm like, fantastic. Great. So, yeah, it's a song called Outlaw. And the title actually comes from I had met Billy Ray Cyrus. And mm. when him and I were chatting, make a long story short, he'd mentioned, he's like, you know, you're an outlaw. You're not like a typical kind of. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. So thank you, Billy Ray. Yeah. <laughs> For giving me a title. Okay. All right. Take it away. <laughs> She's got a fire, hot flame burning on the inside. My desire got caught, trapped in a landslide. Last chance left to fight, gonna make it count. Knock them down when they say you'll never make it now. Time to take it higher. Three, two, one, go. She's an outlaw, reaching for them big stars, making up the rules now as she goes. She's a lone star, gonna take it far, gonna do it on her own on this lonely road. Trains on track, keep.
keep rolling knows just where she's going she's an outlaw reaching for the stars gonna do it on her own down this lonely road nobody's fool she's got control making the right moves keeping it real cool Long shot, no way she gonna lose Game on, keep it strong, cause she's made of steel Blood and sweat, dry the tears, gotta keep it real Set the world on fire Three, two, one, go She's an outlaw, reaching for them big stars Making up the rules now as she goes She's a lone star, gonna take it far Gonna do it on her own on this lonely Trains on track, keep rolling, knows just where she's going. She's an outlaw, reaching for the stars, gonna do it on her own. Down this lonely road, start it up, burning up the ground. Wheels spinning fast, revving engine, tearing up the town. She'll reach the top at the speed of sound. She's an outlaw, reaching for them big stars, making up the rules as she goes. She's a lone star, gonna take it far, gonna do it on her own on this lonely road. Trains on track, keep rolling, knows just where she's going. She's an outlaw, reaching for the stars, gonna do it on her own down this lonely road. Trains on track, keep rolling, knows just where she's going. She's an outlaw, reaching for the stars, gonna do it on her own, down this lonely road. All right. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was awesome. Uh, have you recorded that yet? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that one, and it's released. I think I put it out in April. Okay. So, and there's a video to go along with that. And it's really cool because I have the guys from Puddle of Mud in the video. No. They're my band in the video. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> well, I shot it down in Los Angeles and my producer, I needed musicians. Oddly enough, I'd, they'd done another video with me, Pretty Little Things. They're right. the band in that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I needed in the band again for another music video, I contacted them. I'm like, hey guys, want to do another video? Wow. <laughs> like, sure. That is so cool. They awesome. weren't doing anything at the time, so it was great. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. But I'm sure they would have dropped everything anyway. Of course they would yeah. have. To be in a Susie Corey video, you know? Of course. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, thank you for coming in today. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. And uh, come back anytime. You always have a standing invitation. Next week? Yeah. Next week. <laughs> sure. You know what? We don't have to do the podcast. We'll just come back for the beer. For the beer. Let's have let's <laughs> Steam whistle. <laughs> Jeff's in. Let's have a beer right now. What do you say? <laughs> All right, this has been No Sleep Till Sudbury with Brent Jensen and Susie Corey and Jeff Brown live from the Steam Whistle Roundhouse in downtown Toronto. Until next time, folks, take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Sudbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon worldwide. <laughs>